Thanks, Kieran, and uh, welcome everyone back to uh, Beehive Day 2. Today we're going to shift our focus more toward applying the science of human behavior to designing solutions in the real world. Uh, let me explain. So yesterday in our game show and in our research highlight talks, we talked about how research in the behavioral sciences tells us things like personalize the message and simplify messages and choices and leverage the power of social influence. These sort of principles are based on research insights that tell us sort of generally how people consume information, but they don't actually tell us much about how, say, to personalize the message or what simple messages are likely to work or who are the relevant social groups that are most likely to influence uh, our target audience. To answer those questions, you have to know who and what you're designing for and to have the tools to be able to develop hypotheses about what's going to work in which particular situations with which specific groups of people. Behavior-centered design is an approach that blends uh, design thinking and behavioral science to essentially slow down the planning process of getting from problem to solution and help make sure that what we're going to implement in the real world is actually going to change behavior in a way that sticks. It looks a bit like a formulaic process, but it's not really. We like to call it more of a journey, ideally a journey in the direction of solutions that stick. In one sense, uh, it's an approach to asking the right questions at the right time, uh, beginning first and foremost with what do I want someone to do differently and who as specifically as possible do I want to do it? When we've answered that, we often jump to, well, how do I get them to see things the way that I do? Uh, this is a good way to lead us towards solutions that work for us personally, but not necessarily anyone else. So the second thing we have to do is empathize with our target audience and understand their motivations and barriers uh, from their perspective. Once I'm armed with this information, uh, I can begin to, to bring a behavioral science lens to develop hypotheses about what drivers are most likely to motivate change. This is the really important step where we begin to develop a theory about what psychological and social mechanisms uh, are, are most likely to influence our target audience. For instance, you know, we might discern that the most imposing barrier to change is an assumption that my friends and family uh, expect me to continue doing things the way that I'm already doing them. And so someone who wants me to, to try something new uh, might benefit from showing me that, that my friends are already doing it. Only after we have an explicit hypothesis for, uh, for change that is grounded in science and tailored to our particular audience do we arrive at, at the point where uh, many people prefer to start what we call ideation. This is where we start to dream up all the sort of experiential elements uh, of a program or intervention, the tactics and products and services that are most likely to facilitate the change. But now, because we've spent the time to frame our problem, empathize with our target audience, uh, and map hypotheses that blend user insights with generalized principles from behavioral science, you know, we aren't drawing ideas out of thin air, but rather building them on a theory-driven foundation. Of course, we don't know for sure if this great idea is going to, to work. Uh, so the next two questions we have to ask are, what does it look like in real life? We often call this a minimum viable prototype. Uh, and what happens when I try it even at a small scale, just to test uh, uh, does it actually work? Because you never really know until you try, and it'd be good to know uh, if it works before we, we uh, implement at any sort of significant scale. That may take a few rounds of revision to get it right, after which we can start to look at what will it take to get it to the scale that actually begins to put a meaningful dent in the problem that we're trying to solve. And of course, arrive back at the perennial question uh, that may start the whole process over again, which is, is it still working? So I hope these questions offer a, a useful lens to carry through the, the rest of our time uh, at Beehive. For those with an appetite for more, behavior.rare.org is a place where about 1,500 uh, practitioner members from something around 80 countries are using and sharing a wide range of behavior-centered design tools. Membership is totally free, uh, so I'd highly encourage those who are interested in, in finding more ways to apply behavior-centered design to their work in, in water pollution or other areas um, to sign up there. Without any further ado, uh, I want to send us right into our next session uh, for the day, another inspiring 
uh, uh, behavioral scientist um, with a research feature. Dr. Greg Sparkman is a postdoctoral researcher at the Andlinger Center and Department of Psychology at Princeton University, where he uh, focuses on understanding social change using the tools of social and uh, cognitive psychology. He's doing a lot of really cool work in the areas of social influence, so you're not going to want to miss it. Greg, 